Good morning. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Talukta for inviting me to this uh, colloquium. I think he invited me in the past also, and I could not uh, come, and I'm very pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, what I thought I would do is to talk about a subject which is of some interest to me now, and you will see as I go along that there would be uh, some connections with research programs that uh, institutions in Bangalore hope to initiate in collaborations with institutions uh, in the Northeast. The subject of my talk will really cover a little bit of chemistry and a little bit of biology. So I thought I would really start with this slide where Arthur Kornberg, the discoverer of DNA polymerase, many years ago wrote an article where he called chemistry the lingua franca of the biological and medical sciences. So today, if you want to study biology or you want to study medicine, then it is most important to have a somewhat deep understanding of the underlying chemistry. But there is a fundamental difference in the way chemistry and biology have operated over the years. Uh, chemists have a certain approach to science, our biologists have a different approach to science. These differences are disappearing in the West because education has changed over the years in the West. Unfortunately, in India, education has not really changed with time. And therefore, chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics, these are all treated as completely compartmentalized. And students in BSc and MSc programs are rarely exposed to the other disciplines. Kornberg actually remarked that the two cultures of chemistry and biology may really differ because he said that the root might derive from the apparently more right brain dominated uh, character of biologists and the left brain dominated character of chemists. What does this mean? The right brain actually controls in many ways the more aesthetic and more intuitive aspects of, of the human mind. Whereas the uh, left brain controls the more analytical aspects of the human mind. So like Professor Mukherjee, if you're a mathematician, you're probably using uh, one side of the brain significantly more than if you're a biologist who is observing uh, nature. So Kornberg pointed this out, and I thought this was rather interesting because it gives us an idea of how we view the world around us. So the subject that I really want to introduce today is a subject that I intend to get into, and that is the subject of chemical ecology. I have uh, retired about a year ago, and uh, the good thing to do in retirement uh, is to go home and sit and read something or think about something that you've never uh, thought of before. And I've had the opportunity now to become involved with a program conducted by the National Center for Biological Sciences which is in the area of biodiversity and chemical ecology. And uh, this is a program funded by the Department of Biotechnology, and what it hopes is to integrate <coughs> scientists from the Northeast, institutions in the Northeast, with scientists in Bangalore who are working at institutions like the Indian Institute of Science or the National Center for Biological Sciences. Now, chemical ecology is a new word in India, but it's not really a new word elsewhere. But I thought I would define for you both chemistry and ecology. Because today, if you want to know anything, and if you're a student, I don't think students today go very much beyond Wikipedia. And it turns out that neither do adults. So the first thing that I do when I want to find out a, a definition or an explanation is I click into Wikipedia and see what does Wikipedia have to say. The danger with Wikipedia, of course, is very often all kinds of wrong things are also there in Wikipedia. So it is a bit dangerous, but there is a reasonably good definition of chemistry which you would have been able to read by now. And I think many of you will talk about uh, the branch of physical science that studies the properties of matter. Uh, physics also studies the properties of matter, so in this way physics and chemistry are really together. Ecology, on the other hand, is the scientific analysis and study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. And so one would really be interested in understanding how organisms interact with their environment. As I go along, I will tell you that this is not an abstract area of science to study, 
but it will have in fact many possible applications and there will be many potentially useful findings that one might make if one works in this area. What are the two specific disciplines which are important for chemical ecology? First, of course, is field biology. Those students who like to be out in the open air most of the time observing nature are wonderful field biologists. Then, of course, there are the natural products chemists. Natural products chemists are those who take material which is obtained in nature and now try to work in the laboratory to isolate chemical substances or molecules from them which will have useful properties. India used to have a very fine tradition in natural products chemistry in the 1960s, in the 1950s and the 1960s. But this tradition in natural products chemistry has slowly disappeared over time and in fact today along with many biological species natural products chemists are also extinct in India but they are in fact are reviving all over the world. So I'm going to tell you what is important for natural products chemistry. But how do organisms, if they are interacting with their environment, how do they communicate with one another? It turns out that human beings are in many ways unique. Uh, they are set apart from other biological organisms in that they communicate by sound and they actually use a large number of visual cues for communication. Now you look at me, you hear me, and therefore we are actually communicating. But microorganisms don't talk to one another. A large number of insects, occasionally they may make some sounds, but they don't really talk to one another. And although we sometimes think that maybe dogs are communicating with one another by barking, they're not really very often communicating with one another. Their communication sometimes can be very much more subtle uh, than what we think. How do they communicate? It turns out that really the way organisms communicate with one another, by and large in biology, is through the means of chemicals. They secrete chemicals, they sense chemicals. And it is really this way that communication really happens. You just take a look on your campus itself, you will see a large number of bees and butterflies. And if you look at bees and butterflies and they're going to specific plants, you might ask the question, how do they get there? They get there because they sense a chemical gradient. And so it's chemicals which attract them. You look at the insects, which for example sometimes occasionally will attack the tea crop in, in the northeast. You will look at other crops which are destroyed. You have silkworms here, which sometimes will have a problem. What happens? What happens in these cases is that there are predatory organisms and biological organisms need to defend themselves against these predatory organisms. So everything gets attracted by chemicals, they defend themselves with chemicals. So biology really is, has the most marvelous chemistry that you can possibly find. And biological organisms are constantly engaged in communicating with one another by secreting chemicals. There are chemicals which are volatile chemicals which will go through the air, so you can sense them. I think in the preliminary documentary which was shown about your institution, at the last there was an instrumental facility and there there was these wonderful pictures of a liquid chromatograph and a mass spectrometer uh, there, there were microscopes and so forth. Now if you ask yourself which is the most sensitive spectrometer that you can see around. One of the most sensitive spectrometers that you have, which actually looks at the visible region with exquisite resolution, is the human eye. The other wonderful spectrometer, gas chromatograph, something which senses everything, is your nose. You can sense, uh, sense aromas very well. This morning I had breakfast with Dr. Talukdar and he showed me this uh, black rice, which he said came from Imphal and which has an aroma. So I asked him, what is the aroma? And he correctly told me that the aroma is 2-acetylpyrroline, which is a small chemical. And then I told him a story that uh, Dr. R. L. Brahmachari in Calcutta had many years ago shown that the aroma of basmati rice and the aroma of tiger urine are exactly the same. So whenever you find a tiger urinating somewhere, you get a smell which looks familiar. And that's the smell of basmati rice. And Brahmachari investigated this. And what did he find? He found both substances are in fact identical. It's 2-acetylpyrroline again. 
And therefore, chemistry pervades all of biology. But sometimes when you think about communication, remember that in medicine, communication is hugely important. You are composed of thousands and thousands of cells, and these cells are communicating with one another. Disease happens when this communication goes astray, when there is miscommunication. And this kind of signal transduction in biology really happens when molecules secreted by one cell are recognized by cells somewhere else in the body. This is what we call hormones. And the entire subject of endocrinology, which is a real branch of biochemistry, is, deals with the ways in which molecules are produced in cells which are signaling to other cells, and the ways in which receptors recognize them in the target cells. So the only point that I want to make to you in this presentation is remember that communication in biology is largely through the intermediacy of chemicals. And that is why chemistry is very, very important. Yesterday when I spoke at IIT Guwahati, I did point out to the students there, because when you speak at an IIT, the one thing that students don't like there is biology. And I have realized that when you go to many, many colleges and you ask them, ask the students, which subjects do you like? You'll find lots of students like physics, and you will find uh, lots of students like uh, biology. But there are two subjects which only a minority of students seem to like. One is mathematics, Professor Mukherjee, <laughs> and the other is chemistry, which is my own discipline. And if you ask yourself the question, why do students not like chemistry and mathematics? The real answer is, I think, and I'm not sure, but I think this is the answer, that chemistry and mathematics deal with symbols. They deal with symbols and therefore you have to learn a different language. In the case of mathematics, you learn the language of symbols, you learn the language in which they are related to one another, which are equations, and you learn how these equations actually interact with one another. In chemistry, on the other hand, you will look at structures. So when you see structures, it looks like some kind of shorthand which you cannot understand. And unless you learn the language, you cannot really uh, communicate. And therefore, in fact, you will find that languages are hugely important, except that in India, we are always arguing about language. But there are other languages in science also, which are equally important, and sometimes they are, in fact, difficult to acquire and acquire a mastery over. I'll show you an example. I do not know whether you have these termite mounds in your vicinity. Do you have them? Yes. You have them. Now look at these termite mounds. There are lots of them on our campus. Uh, what do you think lives inside these mounds? Hmm? Does anything live inside them? Yeah? Ants. In the south, however, many people think there are lots of snakes inside them. Yes. Also, and uh, occasionally they will worship them, and you will find wherever there is a termite mount, you will find that there would either be a garland and uh, a picture put on them, and then it will become an uh, object now of devotion. But look at the termite mount. How is it constructed? It's constructed by the termite, pictured over there, but the termite can't do this all by itself. It has to collaborate with another organism, which is a fungus. The fungus you cannot see. It's a microorganism, so you can see it only under the microscope. And together, these two biological organisms, in a symbiotic relationship with one another, they in fact put together this remarkable feat of civil engineering. It's a feat of civil engineering because if you put your finger into one of those holes over there, you will actually find that there's a distinct fall in temperature. There's a distinct fall in temperature because these organisms have now learned how to make holes and draw air currents through the termite mound. It is actually natural air conditioning. We did have this kind of natural air conditioning in what was called green architecture in the 19th and 18th centuries, even in India. Our human beings also knew how to construct buildings. This was before we went to air conditioners and power consumption. So there are ways of green architecture even today. But biology can sometimes inspire physicists, can inspire uh, engineers, and more recently, it is also inspiring mathematicians because of the many, many phenomena 
that one observes in biology, and this is one of them. The sociobiologist E.O. Wilson called the fungus farming termites one of evolution's master clockworks, tireless, repetitive, and precise, more complicated than any human invention, and unimaginably old. And therefore, you see in biology things which will make you wonder. And I don't think, and Wilson, I think, has spent an entire lifetime wondering about the things that one sees in nature. And I'm sure that as students, if you go around in the Northeast, you will find many, many remarkable things to really stimulate your imagination. But the soil is teeming with fungi. There are lots of bacteria, there are lots of fungi in the soil. How does the termite pick up one specific fungus? It does this because it communicates with it by means of chemicals. It will not pick up another fungus. It's only the secretions of these two organisms in concert which allows them to shape mud in such a way that a termite mount can actually be made. So this is an example of the kind of wonders that you can see in biology. But the communication between the termite and the fungus is exclusively chemical in nature. So if you now scrape off secretions from either of these organisms, you can put them into mass spectrometers to get the kind of mass spectra that I have illustrated on this slide. But chemical ecology as a discipline itself, I think, can be traced back to this paper in 1969. I like this paper very much because this is the year I went to do a PhD in the United States. Now, at the end of my career, I wish I had read this paper in 1969 when it first came out because then maybe I would have been attracted to this and would have tried to work in this area maybe 30, 40 years before the area actually became an important area. It is very, very important in science to be able to work in areas which are far ahead of their times. And Thomas Eisner, who is really the founding father of this field, <coughs> looked at the Bombardia beetle. The Bombardia beetle is now an insect. And remember, insects are all around you. Beetles are abundant in nature. J.B.S. Haldane once long ago said, God loves beetles because he produced so many of them. And, uh, but this is attacked by ants. And when it is attacked by ants, it has to defend itself. What does it do? It does this remarkable thing. It produces a spray. It looks like a spray there, but it's actually a flame. It's throwing out a flame. It's taking chemicals, combusting them, burning, and hitting it with a flamethrower. How does it produce this? It produces this, produces this by decomposing, produces hydrogen peroxide, and then decomposes this. Decomposition of peroxides is what, for example, the space scientists use in rocket propellers. So that's exactly, when you see that rocket going up, you see that jet of flame uh, coming out at the bottom on TV. You can wonder, you need all that to propel it up into outer space. Here is biology actually having discovered this many, many years ago. And so there's combustion. Where are these papers now useful? I have put this up just to show you that science really has no boundaries. Here, for example, is a paper in the Journal of Mechanical Engineering Science. Here is a paper in the Journal of Power and Energy. And what are these scientists and engineers trying to do? They are trying to learn some aspects of the ways in which one might solve energy problems of the future, propellant problems of the future, by looking at inspiration from biology. So biology can provide you with an enormous inspiration in other disciplines. All kinds of chemicals appear. Now, in the chemical journals, you will sometimes find the molecule of the week. Here, for example, is a molecule produced by this ladybird insect. Why do these insects and organisms produce these molecules? Because they are competing with other organisms in their immediate environment for nutrients. And therefore, it is competition. Biological competition now induces biological warfare. And therefore, to clear an environment of competitors, they produce weapons. What are their weapons? Their weapons are only chemical. 
you must remember that there is no biological and chemical weapons treaty which operates in nature. And therefore, very often, it turns out that chemistry and biology are the ways in which organisms clear their environments and make an ecological niche for themselves to exist. But once they have made an ecological niche, they usually coexist quite comfortably with our other organisms. They are not, in a sense, mindlessly predatory like human beings. So you will find that molecules which they produce now kill other insects. They kill other organisms. So human beings can now use these now as drugs. So if you want the next generation insecticide, the next generation antibiotic, the place to look for them is really to look in nature. And that is why I believe that the field of chemical ecology and natural products chemistry which will grow with it will provide other kinds of avenues for investigation and there will be useful techn technological consequences of these. Eisner said this wonderfully well uh, sometime before he passed away. He said, new disciplines arise by a convergence of interest. Chemical ecology is the product of a partnership between biologists and natural product chemists, united by a shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. As students participating in a colloquium which is intended to promote interdisciplinarity, I would urge you to look only at this phrase, united by a shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. That those words encompass everything that you need for fruitful scientific collaboration. Those who collaborate might be united by some vision that they share of what will be the outcome of that research. They must also be empowered by complementary skills. If you and I are collaborating, you must have something that you bring to the table and I must bring something complementary to the table and then only will the project actually move forward. They also say to stand by and allow natural products chemistry to vanish or even to be weakened is to deny chemical ecology its future. This is from Cornell University, one of the most advanced universities in the world in the United States. In India, we have forgotten natural products chemistry and I hope that institutions like this one and the other institutions in the Northeast and elsewhere in India will in fact contribute to a revival of natural products chemistry which is extremely important for this area to develop. But biology is full of chemistry, full of molecules. And each molecule has a chemical structure. This is why students hate chemistry. And you can't remember so many things. But students also don't really like language. Because even in a language, your familiarity with the language really depends on the size of your vocabulary. If your vocabulary is very large, you know that language very well. And so in chemistry, if you know a large number of structures, you are of course much better off than if you know a very small number of structures. What's the kind of molecular diversity you have in chemistry? You can go to the chemical abstracts website and you will find a counter. This is like the population counter in Delhi where it will keep on ticking. Tell you how India's population is growing by the minute. Here if you tick, and this is what I have done, over a period of three minutes you can see how many new molecules have been added into the chemical abstracts database. This will tell you the growth of chemistry as a function of time. You can in fact do, do this by going backwards in time and ask whether chemistry is growing faster now or whether it was growing faster uh, five years ago or ten years ago. But really the subject of my talk can be classified as chemical diversity in biology. How do you study these molecules in biology? You need of course to separate natural mixtures and you can separate natural mixtures in many ways. You can extract them with water, you can extract them with organic solvent, you can put them through chromatographs, and then you can analyze them with various kinds of spectrometers. But today chemical analysis is a very important subject. I know that some of you at least would be having Maggi noodles, and you would have heard of the Maggi noodles controversy recently. What are the chemicals that uh, the UP laboratory actually found? They found lead, which I think you will find in water anywhere in India because we have used lead pipes for a very, very long time. The other is monosodium glutamate. But of course, glut glutamic acid is a constituent of proteins. Monosodium glutamate will be there everywhere. In every protein that you consume, when you hydrolyze it, you will get glutamate. Glutamate is a neurotransmitter. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. 
and therefore too much of monosodium glutamate sometimes is bad. So that's the discussion. But you must sometimes know these chemicals, which chemicals occur naturally, in what quantities do they occur, and all of this can be found only if you do chemical analysis. So if you have a natural extract, now you have an extract, let us say, which the tribal peoples have found is extraordinarily useful against some viral fever. You would like to know what are the molecules which are present there. You would do what is called an activity guided fractionation. This means that you would take a crude extract and purify it. So you would do chromatography, you would go and isolate molecules, you would then determine their structures and you would have a biological assay which allows you to see whether the various fractions that you're getting are biologically active or not. Some years ago, I was asked to give a talk, uh, inaugurate like this by lighting the lamp and so forth, a talk in a local college. It was on a workshop on chromatography for students. So at that time, I was the director of the Indian Institute of Science. So I asked the people who came to invite me so many of my colleagues in this big institute are much more knowledgeable about chromatography than I am. Why do you come and ask me to come and give a talk on chromatography? Their answer was rather interesting. They said all the other people are too busy to do this. And they said, uh, well, well, why do you think that I'm not busy? They said, no sir, uh, you can read and come. So they granted me one thing. They granted me that they knew that I was ignorant about chromatography, they accepted that, but they said, anyway you read and come and tell the students about chromatography. So I read, and I read the only way that I know. I went back and asked the question, who are the people who really founded chromatography? Thin layer chromatography received the Nobel Prize a long time ago. So you will find AJP Martin and Singe received the Nobel Prize, so I went and read their Nobel lectures because they wanted to separate substances on paper, and uh, uh, by using paper chromatography. And there I found something which I have now labeled as Martin's principle. He said, nothing is too difficult as long as someone else does it. And uh, this is what students do. So professors tell the students which extracts from which you isolate molecules, and then the students have to do chromatography to actually find the molecules. Chromatography can be very tedious because you separate molecules depending on their abilities to be absorbed onto solid uh, surfaces and the more patiently you do it, the more you're going to purify uh, substances. Okay. Once you've done that, you have other methodologies. I'm going to introduce you only to one, which is mass spectrometry, and you have a mass spectrometer right in this institute. Now look at techniques. Where do they come from? Most techniques that we use today in biology and medicine have their origins in physics. J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron Really at the turn of the 19th century, the beginnings of the 20th century, that is a starting point because J.J. Thompson measured the mass to charge ratio of the electron. Today what do we do in mass spectrometry? We measure the mass to charge ratio of molecules. And since molecules are simply atoms connected to one another, whether you determine the mass to charge ratio of the electron or the mass to charge ratio of a molecule, you are effectively doing the same thing. The only problem to remember here is this is a gas phase measurement. So you have to take molecules in the gas phase. And students will know that the only molecules which will go into the gas phase are small molecules. The larger that molecules become, it becomes harder and harder to take them into the vapor phase. That problem was solved really towards the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, when uh, John Fenn invented the technique of electrospray ionization mass spectrometry. So when you say liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry connected to one another, you really have to thank John Fenn who did this. He found that if you have a spraying liquid and you spray it under the influence of an electric field through a very, very narrow capillary, you have molecules which come out and trapped in water droplets. And slowly as the water evaporates, naked molecules go into the vapor phase. And this is a process of electrospray ionization. And when molecules go into the vapor phase, they can go into a mass spectrometer and then you can measure their mass. Today, there is no upper mass limit for mass spectrometry. You can measure masses up to millions of doctors, millions of times more complicated than the hydrogen atom. So that's what you do. Every atom has a different mass. And therefore, if you have atoms connected in molecules, every molecule can be labeled with a mass. And uh, one can use mass measurement as a kind of marker for the identity of a molecule. 
Today I noticed as I was coming, there was some student who had put up a poster on extraterrestrial life or extraterrestrial biology. Here is an example of a meteorite which fell in Australia 40 years ago. If you preserve these samples carefully, you will find that the science advances, the technologies of science also advance, you can analyze the same sample many years later and find new things. Here, for example, the Murchison meteorite which fell in Australia. Now you find that there are as many as 14,000 distinct chemical formulae which can be measured here. And if this is not contaminated from terrestrial sources, this means that extraterrestrial chemistry is quite rich. And if extraterrestrial chemistry is rich, then of course it raises that wonderful question which I, all of us used to think about uh, 50 years ago when the Apollo missions were going to the moon, whether there would be life somewhere else uh, in outer space. I think it is a fascinating question to think about and I think it should engage young students for many, many decades uh, uh, to come. You can analyze anything. You can analyze blood, for example, today. Two proteins in blood. Hemoglobin inside the red blood cell. Albumin outside in the plasma. And you can isolate both of these from blood and then analyze them with mass spectrometry and you can measure their exact masses. The one thing that I would tell you today is mass spectrometry is the fastest growing chemical analysis tool uh, in science. Its sensitivity and resolution are unparalleled. And today you can measure masses of a molecule to one thousandth of a Dalton. Remember the Dalton is the mass, one Dalton, of the hydrogen atom. And the mass of the hydrogen atom really comes from the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. And therefore you will find that you have a tremendous resolution uh, with which you can label molecules with their masses. So anything. Here, for example, from nature, this is a bee found on the Indian Institute of Science campus and very frequently stings everybody. It makes no distinctions between people and even though I was the head of the institution, they stung me. And then once, having been stunned, uh, I asked one of my postdocs and he was enthusiastic enough immediately to catch another bee and then pull up the sting, look at it under the electron microscope and also get a mass spectrum of whatever was there. That's what you see here. There are peptides here which one can analyze. Sometimes when you're stung, you will find this real remarkable feeling. You're stung and you, you're really annoyed because it's hurting you like crazy. And, uh, but in addition to pain, you also feel numb. And you actually wonder, how can you feel so much pain and feel numb at the same time? So there appears to be something that resembles an anesthetic effect. But it's not quite an anesthetic effect because it doesn't relieve you. This is because so many molecules there. And these molecules are targeting all the membrane receptors which are sense, uh, sensors for pain and so forth. So you have enormous amount of biology to be learned. So whether it's bees or wasps, this is a colleague at the center at the Agricultural University in Bangalore who studies wasps, who gives me that up. But I will show you very briefly in the next few minutes. This is Professor Krishnan, who is really the architect of this chemical ecology program and this collaboration with the Northeast. He single-handedly went to every institution uh, in Bangalore. He also single-handedly went to every institution in the Northeast. And he traveled a great deal. And he tried to persuade everybody to join in. Now, Professor Krishnan died suddenly last year uh, when this program had actually reached the stage where it was about to be funded by the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, Professor Krishnan was also my first PhD student, although he was slightly older than me when I joined the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, the two of us uh, were united only by one quality, our total ignorance of biology. And uh, we both learned biology together. He learned biology a lot faster than me because he was a naturalist, whereas I was very much more of a laboratory scientist. And over the years, in the last 40 years, Krishnan became, I think, probably one of India's foremost uh, naturalists trying to persuade every kind of scientist to get involved in this particular program. And uh, whether it was the Andamans or the Northeast, uh, he went there. 
and he observed the biological phenomenon. And uh, he persuaded me many years ago to work on the cold snail venom toxins. And the way he did this was he collected cold snails off the coast of Rameshwaram uh, in Tamil Nadu. And having he made friends with the fishermen, and the fishermen collected the snails for him, and uh, he extracted the venom by taking live snails, uh, cone snails, to the barber shop which was there and borrowing a little bit of alcohol from the barber shop, taking scissors, dissecting the venom duct and putting it into the alcohol and then extracting molecules from this. But the wonderful thing was, with this very primitive kinds of methodologies, one was able to find something or the other there and it was a problem. So one day he arrived in my laboratory with a backpack full of uh, comb snails uh, and shells and he emptied them on my desk and said, uh, aren't these wonderful? They were not wonderful because they smelt very bad. <laughs> and uh, I told him, it's not wonderful. He said, no, look at them, they're so wonderful. I said, what's so wonderful about them? He said, there are all kinds of molecules there. I asked him, what do you want me to do about it? He said, I want you to study them. Because if there was one thing that Professor Krishnan did not like or did not quite uh, uh, feel comfortable with, it was chemistry. So the way our partnership worked was he did the biology, I did the chemistry. And uh, it worked wonderfully well. Now, unfortunately, I'm sort of uh, handicapped by the fact that I now have to try and do the biology myself and try to persuade other people uh, to help me along with this kind of problem. But the snails produce a very large number of toxins and these toxins now are used by the snail because it cannot move. It's, it has to actually engulf prey. It paralyzes prey, doesn't permit them to move. So it's a, the classic example of a predator-prey relationship in biology. The snail hits fishes, it hits worms, it hits other mollusks. And in turn, the fishes, mollusks and others evolve, changing their receptors. So if one wants to study receptor biology, all kinds of receptor biologies, then I think you have a fascinating problem over here because of the enormous evolutionary variation in these. This is what the venom duct looks like. This is the harpoon-like structure, the radular tooth, which is coated with the venom, which it shoots into the prey. The venom is full now of molecules, and that's what we study. We study them by many methods. We study them by chromatography and mass spectrometry. But we also study them by a new method which I thought I would very briefly mention here, that is next generation sequencing. You can take a DNA sequences. What you do is you take the duct and from the duct you extract messenger RNA. And you convert messenger RNA now into cDNA. And once you've got the complementary DNA, you can now sequence it. How do you sequence complementary DNA? Because DNA is long. You, today's technologies of next generation sequencing simply allow you to break the DNA. And you break it into pieces which are sometimes not more than a hundred nucleotides long, except that you have millions and millions of pieces. And all you have to do nowadays is to use a wonderful sequencer co called the Illumina sequencer, which then sequences all of these for you. You get millions and millions of sequences, all hundred letters long. A, T, G, C are letters which every student of biology now knows. So you have strings of A, T, Gs and Cs. But how do you put them together? This is the task of assembly. That's what I've tried to illustrate on the extreme left of the side. If you were given a book, a thousand page book, and all the thousand pages were loose and not bound to one another, and there was a text in them, and I scattered the thousand pages all over this room, and now I asked you, and the pages are not numbered, I asked you to put them back together so the entire text makes sense. What would you have to do? You would have to read. You would have to read. So you'd have to read the first page you picked up and read the other 999 pages and see which one related to this. You can think about this problem, it will be a maddening problem. But in the case of nucleotides, there's the advantage. That's the Watson-Crick base pair which allows some kinds of constraints to be made. But even if the Watson-Crick base pair constraints are there, reading the grammar becomes extremely difficult. Who are the people who have solved this problem? It's actually mathematicians and computer scientists who have provided the assembly tools for this. This is a subject today which is largely a computer science subject of how to assemble NGS sequences together. Today you will hear a great deal of talk 
even when Mr. Modi goes to the United States and talks about digital India and all of this, one aspect is connectivity, the other aspect is big data analysis. In India we believe we have big data because we have a big population. But we don't collect the data properly, we don't organize the data properly, we have no ways of analyzing the data. These are the deficiencies that we must in fact confront. So you must see, think about this problem. This is a problem coming from biology. The biggest data today to analyze is in biology. So biology today requires more help from mathematics and computer science than almost any other discipline. And this is an aspect which is very well recognized in the West. Mass spectrometry is a way in which you break molecules, you break them into pieces. You know, I can illustrate this. If I took the glass which is dead and smash the glass on the ground, it will break into lots of pieces. If I sent you out of the room and then broke the glass here and then asked you to come and pick up all the pieces and tell me, put them all back together and tell me what have, you bro what have I broken, you'd find it very difficult to do. If I broke it very hard, you'll get large number of pieces. The problem will become very difficult. If I broke it very gently and broke it into two pieces, anybody will solve it because they will put those two pieces back together and tell me that I've broken the glass. So it's just like doing a jigsaw puzzle. The larger the number of pieces, the harder it is to piece the puzzle together. That's the problem of molecular structure determination using mass spectrometry. Because you take molecules into the gas phase, break them, and then you try to piece them together to find out what you have got. So in this particular case, of peptides and proteins, you have one advantage. You can use next generation sequencing data and mass spectrometry in conjunction with one another. If I recognize a little piece from here, I can go back to a translated DNA sequence to see whether I see the same piece there and then slowly elongate the sequence. And all that is possible because of the watson crick structure of DNA, because of the fact that I know what is base pairing and uh, I know the genetic code so I have an enormous amount of information already available in this process. So that's what it would look like. That's a, a next generation assembled sequence. It would be an absolutely meaningless tree, string of letters translated into six frames because you don't know where to start. Those of you who studied molecular biology and reading will know that you have to start in one way and read using the triplet code. But if I don't know where to start, if I have an ATGC sequence, I can read it in six different frames. This way, this way, three frames this way, three frames this way. This means five-sixths of the translated sequences are noise. Only one-sixth of the translated sequences is signal. And when signal is very weak and noise is very high, it's again only electrical communication engineers who actually like to bring signal out of noise and find various ways of suppressing noise and enhancing signal. Those kinds of methodologies sometimes work here also. So I won't bother you too much with this, except to tell you that biodiversity in snails is remarkable, and therefore you can isolate many genes from snails, sequence them, you can get large numbers of toxins, and that is what we have been doing. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Krishnan did not live to see this, but the day that he died, and he died very, very suddenly, he was in the laboratory uh, till lunchtime, and in an hour later, he had just closed his eyes and gone. The very next day, I was about to show him last year the first of the NGS assembled sequences that I show you. But you can see that in the previous five years, we did not learn how to put these together. But after we have learned, you can see how many genes have actually been put together. And last year, uh, last May, in 2014 May, we had exactly one or two sequences put together. So these are methodologies that once you learn, you can do them very much faster. The two kinds of mechanisms of polypeptide synthesis, ribosomal and non-ribosomal. This is what leads to diversity of proteins and peptides in nature. Proteins are exclusively products of ribosomal synthesis, and all the other fungal and microbial peptides are very often the products of non-ribosomal synthesis. But when we look at molecules, remember this. Natural molecules come from microorganisms, plants, and animals. Many times they're called secondary metabolites. In biochemistry courses, they are dismissed as secondary metabolites and sometimes not studied further. But secondary metabolism, these authors many years ago said this very eloquently. They said secondary metabolism 
represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. Biological organisms are always looking to chemistry to solve their problems. So here you will find that we worry about subjects, things in science like discovery, invention and innovation. Fleming discovered penicillin accidentally. Innovation, for example, Edison invented the light bulb. So you must sometimes make the distinction between discovery and innovation and invention. Innovation, I will leave to you to define in your own way. But really when we try to do science, we would all like to discover something or we would all like to invent something. It's not always possible, but one can try. And I think there are many, many things now still to be discovered when we look at natural products. That is simply Fleming and his. Why is it important? And I'm going to conclude now over taking a little bit more time than I should. You look at this. This is antibiotic resistance which is being discussed in the newspapers here. And one of the enzymes which created a big stir a few years ago was the enzyme which appeared and was named after our national capital. It was called the New Delhi beta lactamase. This is a beta lactamase produced by resistant organisms which now break down the beta lactam antibiotics the penicillins and the cephalosporins. Very, very dangerous because these organisms have now developed resistance. How do they develop resistance? They develop resistance by chopping up the beta-lactams which are important. The problem is that if the beta-lactam antibiotics, if you get resistant to them, then you have to go to the other antibiotics. Both cholestin and vancomycin are extremely toxic antibiotics. So patients who suffer now from drug resistance infection have a great problem. And the way these things work are there are enzymes and they simply break the beta-lactam bond. Look at that wonderful structure of the beta-lactamase. This hall is named, named after Dorothy Hodgkin. Dorothy Hodgkin was a structural biologist. In the old days the word structural biology had not been invented. She was what we called a protein crystallographer. She was a crystallographer to begin with, who solved the structure of penicillin. She also solved the structure of insulin. And these are similar molecules, and they break the beta-lactam. This beta-lactam structure I have put here, because your hall is named after Dorothy Hodgkin. And this is the structure which she found for the very first time. Her picture is up there. It's a young picture of Dorothy Hodgkin there, and she was young when she did... Uh, uh, found the structure of penicillin. Penicillin at that time was an unprecedented skeleton. The organic chemists did not believe that structure, such a structure, the beta-lactam structure, could actually exist. And it was first demonstrated by Crystal Oak. You must sometimes be inspired by the pictures that you see around you. When you look at the DNA structure, look at Rosalind Franklin. It's her photograph her X-ray photographs of DNA, which really permitted Watson and Crick to put together the double helical stuff. I'm going to show you only two pictures, because I want to show you two examples from the very recent literature, because I hope that some students at least will then want to do research and try to find new things. Here, for example, is an antibiotic. The latest antibiotic which kills pathogens without detectable res resistance. Paper appeared in Nature in January 2015. It's a rather complex peptide antibiotic, but the way this has been found is by trying to culture unculturable organisms in the soil and developing a device which allows you to culture them, not in laboratory media, but in an environment of the soil itself and get them to a concentration within a small plate and then apply laboratory conditions to grow them further. These are now Staph aureus strains resistant to vancomycin. And you can see the clearance of the bacteria in <coughs> the ones which use the new antibiotic types of bacteria. And in this last example which I will show you is if you develop beta lactamase and antibiotic resistance, the next thing that you would like to do is to inhibit the beta lactamase. Because then if you give your antibiotic along with an inhibitor, then you will overcome resistance. Where will the inhibitor come from? Once again from a soil microorganism. And this molecule has been isolated from a fungus. And it is from this fungus that you will find that 
the prospects of overcoming antibiotic resistance are appearing in the literature. These are papers which have appeared in 2014 and 2015 on the wonderful potential of molecules from nature. And the discoverer of streptomycin in the 1950s in his Nobel lecture actually said this. He quoted the Christian scriptures. He said, the Lord hath created medicines out of the world, and he that is wise will not abhor them. Where have these medicines been created? They are being created by the microorganisms which are teeming in the soil. Finally, this year's Nobel Prize, announced a few years ago for medicine, recognized Satoshi Omura and William Campbell. What did they do? They found ivermectin. Where did they find ivermectin from? From streptomyces. The same organism, maybe a different strain, which produced streptomycin long, long ago in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. Used now for filariasis. UU2. I made this slide some years ago, so I'm rather proud of this slide. She isolated an anti-malarial at the height of the Cultural Revolution in China where they extracted thousands of plants and tested them in malaria-infected mice and for parasite clearance. Only one extract worked, and that extract was irreproducible. Irreproducibility is what she examined, and she found the reason for irreproducibility, and that's given on the next slide. When she went back to the old Chinese literature, she found that the leaves were being, the plant was being extracted with cold water. Whereas the organic chemists, when they extract anything, they put it into a flask, pour water or an organic solvent, and then boil it. This is why organic chemistry labs always resemble kitchens, because they're always boiling something or the other. And uh, it turns out that the structure of artemisinin came many years later. There's the peroxide, an unprecedented structure. And like I told you at the beginning, peroxides can explode, they can decompose. So once you heated it, the biological activity was lost. So it tells you that it's very important to look at these organisms. The statins, which some of the older people might in fact use if they get heart disease, uh, cholesterol lowering agents, these are again from microorganisms. I will end by quoting one of the most famous microbiologists who discovered archaea and actually gave us this tree branch of the tree of life, Carl Roots, who said, in a tribute to him on the internet after he passed away, this picture was there and also this quotation from the ancient literature where it says that nature is to be found in her entirety, nowhere more than in her smallest creatures. What it means is, I would simply change this to say, chemistry is to be found in her entirety, nowhere more than in her smallest creatures, which means the connection between chemistry and microbiology and nature must be very sharply drawn. Last of all, although I have taken a little, little bit more time than was allotted to me, I will end by thanking the institution in which I have worked for the last 40 years and which has permitted me to do whatever I like and read whatever I like without placing any restrictions whatsoever. Thank you very much.